All right, so we've had a look at how to identify risk at the various steps across the process. The next question is, uh, does it matter? Now, what risks are worth solving? What risks are worth living with? So I want to have a, a, an activity that lets us ask that question. Does it matter? If it doesn't matter, fine. If it does matter, let's solve that problem before it becomes a, a disaster to us. So we're looking at um, a scenario that explains how to achieve an outcome. Basically, tell me what right is, show me what right is, teach me what right is, and I'll do it the right way. So I've got to develop the script of what the right way is, down to the nitty gritty, even to the words to say, uh, the things to write, you know, forms to fill out, uh, records to make of particular situations, databases to keep up to date, all that sort of stuff I'm going to put into my procedure. Now, in this situation here, if we, for example, see or one of these lean concepts, 5S for example, 5S is a lean concept of workplace management. Now if in the scenario we're developing to solve problems, another person's idea is good to, to draw into this solution, then, then I would do that. You know, any Japanese concept in lean that improves and lowers the risk profile, I think it's worth having a serious look at. What I would make sure I would do is if we're going to adopt 5S for example as a workplace management, I would write 5S into the script. I would actually say, here is your duty statement and here are the 5S requirements you must do. Here are the three processes that you are responsible for and at these steps in the process, you have to do these 5S activities. A lot of companies train the people in 5S and because they train them, the message goes into the brain, they think they now know how to use 5S, how to apply it properly, when to apply it, and they think the training is sufficient. And so the consultant goes away and now guys, do 5S. And it never takes, because in one training session you can't pick up all the knowledge and skills that 5S requires for it to work properly. What's missing is it's never actually written into the job requirements. Practice 5S, it becomes words that people hear, but never how do I put 5S, how do I use 5S in this part of the job right now? At this step here, how does 5S apply in this step here? So when we come to scripting things up, we are going to be very clear. This is th all the requirements to get this job done properly. And if 5S includes putting tools back on the shadow board at a particular step in the process, put tools back on the shadow board at this point in the process. And we'll write that in there on purpose. If there's no shadow board, we will say, well, you can't complete that process. Get a shadow board put up. So we're going to recognise where the risks are and we want to process to find those risks and understand the business impact of that risk. That process, when it comes to machinery, already exists. We call it equipment criticality. And I, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. That process works very well to recognise the troubles a particular ma machine or asset brings to, to, this pro to, the, to the company. Want to grade the size of the risk. As I say, if the risk is unimportant, uh, we'll work on the stuff that is more important. So I've got to have a, a grading process as simple as you possibly can make it. Low, medium, high and extreme risk. So this will tie back to the risk matrix. So the matrix that everyone now uses for safety, OC health and safety, we're going to take that concept into OC health and safety for machines as opposed to for people. Now one of the situations we have to appreciate is our machines are always in a, a risk state, always in a state of risk because every single part in a machine, and this is just a pump set, this is a simple one to talk about, but every single part in the motor, every single part in the wet end are all degrading at their own rate, depending upon how that machine is being used, depending upon how flat that base plate is, depending upon how aligned those shafts are. So every component in there is degrading. Each component has its own P point and its own F functional failure point. And when any of these hit a functional failure point, that machine stops. So this degradation curve applies to the machine as a complete assembly and also to each individual part. And because each part has its own curve, it means each part has its own effect on that component. And this is a random situation. When the P-point on the impeller appears and when the P-point on the bearing appears and when the P-point on the winding appears, it's up. But no, it's all whatever happens. It's a risk situation. So we've got a risk situation where if we are unlucky and it fails and there's a, a, we, we don't pick up the problem until it's a, a major cost, then that cost uh, can be excessive. If I pick it up early before the function will fail you, I can do a planned job and that planned job is a certain cost. 
If I miss that and we go to a breakdown, then that cost is unknown until we actually can fix it. So we have a, an unknown cost scenario depending upon which part fails, when it fails and the circumstances around, uh, around that situation. This degradation curve, of course, depends upon the stress in those parts. This degradation curve can be very long if there's low stress and not often the machine's not used very often. Or if there's high stress and high temperature and high loads, high pressures, that curve can drop away very quickly. So I've got a situation of, of unknown cost and unknown time when things are going to happen. Um, so the whole situation is, is a risk-based scenario. There is so much uncertainty that we are trying to understand and control, which then means I have uh, probability. Probability becomes a factor in understanding my options that, I, that I've got available to do. So yeah, our machines are a bit more difficult to work with than simply uh, looking at those and using them and maintaining them. There's a, a lot of unknowns, a lot of risks always present. And depending upon how those holes in the Swiss cheeses that we use as barriers, as maintenance, operating practices, installation practices, uh, selection practices line up, um, these failures could happen at any time and could be any cost. So if I've got a risk situation, it means I can then use a risk matrix to, to model that situation. I want to turn the unknown into something visible. That's the whole point of having a risk matrix. To show, to talk to, talk to people about, look, this is where we are right now. Here are the many impacting factors. If we are very unlucky and we miss the, uh, the P point and we end up in a breakdown, that breakdown cost will be here. Now that's worst case, so it's very easy to find the worst case scenario, worst case cost, and that's the only thing you and I will ever agree on. What's the worst case situation if that pump fails in this business uh, and, and we can calculate that worst case scenario? So I want to know the worst case first, because that one we'll both agree on. There'll be no fights over that. What we will argue over is other situations and other costs that could arise, but if I can find on my risk matrix the unquestionable worst case scenario, then we've got a point to start with. I'm then going to ask, uh, in this case here, our pump has got a, a problem. Uh, the curve is beginning, to, has, is beginning to drop away. So we've raised a work order to repair this pump. We, you know, vibration or temperature or something's triggered off a recognition of, of the degradation happening. In this case here, um, I've given myself uh, a week. Um, our understanding is between the P and the F, the, the PF win interval, PF window, is about a month from our experience of machinery and of the science of failure. So I said, okay, let's raise the work order and repair this in the coming week. If I can get to this machine in the coming week and uh, do this job, then I know the cost. It'll be a planned cost. It'll be maybe two hours outage, maybe three hours outage, which I can cost up the lost production time. So I can get a number that reflects a planned job outage and show that on my risk matrix. If I can get to this job as we plan right now, the cost will be here. And, and uh, it may in fact be in the blue depending upon you know, the total cost. But the point is I can get now two ends of an envelope of risk. Now if I then say, look, I'm sorry, can't give it to you this week. I'll give it to you next week. Well now two weeks into our one month. Um, now I'm counting on that curve not changing. I'm counting on that curve to be one month degradation. But it might change. You know, I have no idea. It depends upon the stress in that part. That curve can drop away like this. So I could be very unlucky and, and we, we agree, OK, let's reschedule one more week. And I'm hoping, I'm praying that it doesn't fall away in that one week period. If it does fall away, bang, breakdown, I've lost it all. If it doesn't fall away, then my risk has obviously moved up because I'm now halfway into a one month and um, I'm not certain I'll actually make that full distance. There's a deg degree of uncertainty. Uh, there's a, the risk is always there and getting more and more the longer and the longer I wait. Because I know after a month I will definitely be in a failure situation. I'm two weeks into a month. That risk must be rising. The longer I wait, I must be rising in risk. So now I've got a picture of what's happening now, Mr. Production Manager, with that pump on your process. When it fails, you will lose $200,000 in an instant. If we get to it next week, it only cost you $20,000. If we go another week later, um, we could be putting the company in jeopardy. So now we've got a real visual indicator of what we're carrying. Now, it's not hidden anymore. Could be as bad as $200,000, could be as cheap as $20,000.
you make the call, Mr. Manager. You're the plant owner. You're the, operating, you're the operators of the plant. You own that equipment. You decide. Now, when we, have, when we have a car, we decide when to put the car in for a service. We decide which service station and which service, man, uh, which service people do that repair. Same with operating plant people. They own the equipment and they have the right to decide how they wish to use that plant. What they often don't see is the risks they're secretly carrying but don't realise they're carrying. So I want to make a visual indicator of, hey, this is the risk envelope and anything in there could happen. Now, this risk envelope is obviously in a high extreme risk area. So if this was a true situation, anything we do here, um, we have to be very careful of because the amount of money we're going to lose here is, is high money. If that envelope spread across into my low risk area and you know, I'm still sitting down here after a fortnight, I might just say, look, we're going to push, our, push the barrier here. It appears as if I'm going to have a bit of room to play with. Now, if the uncertainty is too great, what we then do with our technician, if the uncertainty is, hey, I have to be more sure that we're going to make the whole month, then what I'll do is get a, a vibration analysis guy down or, or a, an expert in pumps and say, come down, tell me please what you think is happening with this pump. Will it go the two weeks that we want? So this uncertainty, we don't have to necessarily live with. There are ways to be sure if this curve's falling away fast or degrading slowly. But it may require a professional expert in that area of knowledge to, to advise us in that. Here's a real case in a company in Australia, a mine site. <coughs> this is a return roller on a conveyor belt. Um, obviously that return roller has failed, it's broken in half, it's, and it's been that way a long, long time. Because just here, you can see that the metal on the edge has been worn away. On that roller there, the roller is actually worn, it's shaped like that. That has seized in place and the belt rubs across the roller. And as the belt rubs, it wears away the material. The trouble is here, once that material wears away and the actual wall thickness is worn through, we get a knife edge. When that wall thickness is worn through, we get a knife edge, literally a sharp knife edge. So now we've got this knife edge and the belt's running across the knife edge. At that point in time, a couple of things can happen. The knife edge can catch the belt and it tears the belt all the way down. We'll actually cut the belt in half all the way down. And this can be a couple of kilometres long of belt, huge length of belt. And now the belt's torn all the way for two kilometres. Or it can be even worse and be unlucky and, and the knife edge shaves away the rubber. The rubber shavings get carried by the conveyor to the electric motor and drive unit and gearbox at the end of the conveyor. And these shavings build up around the electric motor, around the gearbox, get so hot they catch a light and burn the whole conveyor system down. Those are things that can happen once we get a knife edge on these uh, rollers. So I can model the various scenarios of risk depending upon what happens uh, in the company. Now, it, it doesn't mean there will be a burnt conveyor every time there's a knife edge. It doesn't mean there'll be a torn belt every time there's a knife edge. But with a knife edge there all the time, the opportunity, opportunity is there all the time. And now I'm counting on chance not happening. So if the conveyor's working, if the con conveyor roller is working properly, it's rotating as it should, then the risk is where it should be. It's designed to rotate and to carry the load and to do its job and, and the risk is acceptable in the blue zone. Once the conveyor seizes and um, the roller no longer turns, it is not doing its job. It's just sitting there frozen. We begin wearing away that roller until the knife edge gradually appears. Well, at the point it's seized, the risk obviously begins to increase. While it's rotating and doing its job, there's very little risk of, of having a disaster with a conveyor. Once the seizing of the roller occurs, I've now raised the risk to the point where if I, um, where there is a clear evidence that I'm now carrying more, more chance of fate than, than I was before. If I do nothing to replace that roller, as has been done here, they've done nothing to replace it, and to get to this level here of, of damage would be a couple of months of rubbing. So that this has been failed for a couple of months at least. Now once I get to the point I get a knife edge, 
I'm now in a situation where, gee, I can get a tear. And that tear is going to cost me $200,000 to replace that whole belt when it tears. Now, the fact that if I, and, and also on top of that, it can go one other way, one other pathway into the shave conveyor that goes and catches the light and burns the whole thing down. Now, if the whole system burns down, I lose $2 million. So I can paint for our production people what the situation is. Once I get a seized roller, I can say, Mr. Production Manager, I've got to get to that roller in the next couple of weeks. I can't wait a couple of months because if I wait a couple of months, here are the two things that could happen. May not. I'm not saying it will, but they could because the opportunity now is there for them to happen. Once that knife edge starts, these two pathways open up. Until the knife edge is not there, then it's, it's just a seized, a seized bearing, easy to, 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 to manage. That's why we have this risk matrix in, in plant wellness. Now, how is the knife edge caused? What causes the knife edge? <clears throat> I think just get um, an example. Let's just say that's the roller at the end there. The roller's round. This is a round, rotating, spinning uh, roller. The conveyor belt rubs across the roller, the weight of the belt drives the, the roller. So this is turning like that all the time. Okay, so the conveyor belt runs across. Once that seizes, jams, the bearing will seize. The bearing seizes, that conveyor belt is rubbing. Rubs like this. So rubber running across steel after a couple of weeks wears through the surface. So it wears down. So I wear away the belt and now I've cut off this top section. So along this edge here... So that belt will wear away yeah. that. Yeah. See, this belt is in a mining situation. Dust and dirt sits on the belt. It's an abrasive. The belt... Rubber is an abrasive when it rubs across the surface over enough time. So it's like a sanding belt. Yeah. Yeah. Very much the case. So once that sanding belt wears through the surface, this edge here is, is developed. That's a knife edge, literally. You'll, you'll cut your finger on how sharp it is. And once that knife edge develops, you've got two scenarios that could happen. May not, but could, because opportunity is there. Now chance comes into play. Yeah? And is this my unlucky day or is it my lucky day? Well, how do they know no idea. if a uh, bearing has seized up? You can go and touch it. But don't Ooh. they have miles of this? Yeah. That it's kind of inaccessible? <clears throat> Look, um, not, what they do, they get a thermography camera. They get a thermography camera and they walk the conveyor walk the conveyor and look for hot spots, look for hot bearings. And that's the best they can do, I mean... Uh... Well, it's, it's... There are so many of them, there are so many kilometres of these belts, it's the easiest and quickest way to do it. Let the thing fail, let the thing seize on purpose, because you won't know it's a problem until it actually seizes. You know, most of these rollers are trouble-free for a long time, most of them. But every now and again, they're not. So to go and test every single roller to find the one in 2000 that's a problem, it's very expensive. The quickest way is to get your thermography camera out and in fact, they, you can always drive down the conveyor line. You know, in, in a car, you just drive down slowly looking for the hot spots. It, it's not difficult to do these days. Or when it's really bad, you walk the conveyor system and listen for the squeal because it'll squeal like a, a, a lot of noise. Does it lose lubricant or what? I've never gone into the reasons why. That there would be reasons. Uh, poor fitting, badly fitted, lubrication problems. Yeah, all those things of bearings come into play. Maybe underloaded bearing. You know, they've got a wrong, wrong choice of selection for bearing. There, there are, there are, any bearing failure factors would be issues here. But the consequence is massive. Yeah? Two million dollars um, because I didn't bother fixing this when I had, a, you know, when I had plenty of time to fix it. So yeah, we want to paint the picture. And I've got to be honest here, in, in my career now, I've heard of this happening, a complete system being burnt down twice you know, in my whole career. I've only ever heard it happening twice. It doesn't happen very often, but it, it can happen. Torn belts are regular. In a mining game, ripped belts, you know, the full length, very, very common. As in you know, every month, somebody in Australia, well, many companies in Australia would have, would have a torn belt. They have to replace the entire belt? Stop the system. Unbog the, unload the conveyor, get out there and either, if they can, if the tear isn't too long, they'll cut that section out and, and splice in a new bit of, set of conveyor. If the whole conveyor is torn, all two kilometres are torn, for example, or whatever the distance is, 
We're going to replace the whole belt. How about just having uh, stages of belts in series, so you don't have to replace two kilometers, you just replace a shorter. That would, be, would have been looked at, I'm sure. That two kilometers, I guess, is certainly an extreme length. Often they're only a couple of hundred meters, half a kilometer. But yeah, they would have, you know, that's where the guys at the design stage, when it's still a drawing on the drawing board, should have gone through the optimization loop we saw yesterday. You should have thought about, gee, this will happen. Torn belts will happen. They How do we minimize the they, cost? Uh, they felt they'd introduced too much risk. You got all the more drives. And Look, I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's the whole game we're playing. How do you minimize that risk right down to what we're willing to live with? And when it goes against us, stop bitching about it. You've made that choice and it's gone against us. So just pay the money and get on with it. Yeah, but I want to understand that risk on the drawing board. I don't want to build this plant and then find, you know what, that conveyor is two kilometres long. It'll cost me a million dollars each time the belt goes down. Let's put in three or four conveyors. Let's cut down a half kilometre conveyors and that'll be minimise my cost. That's a design choice that should have been made on the drawing board before the design was approved um, to be installed. That's how I read it. So yeah, our risk equation, important stuff, because when something goes wrong, that consequence is a given. I'm going to lose that much money depending upon the incident. All I can play with is opportunity. Have no opportunity for things to go wrong, because when opportunity is there, all I've got left is chance. The dice roll out of my control, and how they turn up, I've got to live with it. So what we want to work with is, is these two factors. Never let your conveyor rollers develop a knife edge. Simple rule. If you can't get to it immediately, well then monitor this on a regular basis. Go by there every day if you need to and have a look. How quickly is this wearing away? Now keep, keep the flag raised high. This is high risk, guys. We're playing with danger here. Playing with $2 million down the drain if the dice roll the wrong way. So we've covered this, I think, fairly reasonably in terms of the intent of this. So I've broken the cells up long scale, broken it up into, I guess, quantifiable values. $30, $100, $300, $1,000, $3,000, $10,000. I want to have a reasonable size cell that I can locate the value fairly closely. What this does to me very, very quickly is give me a financial position of what money the company's at risk without going through all these spreadsheets and looking at all the breakdown costs and getting a total business-wide cost that takes me two days to work out, very quickly, within a couple of cells, I can be where it's going to be if things go uh, against us. Now, if that's too high a risk, obviously I can't live there because it all depends on luck. Can I, can I run a business by luck, you know, just toss a coin and hope it falls the right way? Run a, run a, run a business that way there, well, your call, it's your business, but it's a you know, hard way to make a living, very dangerous way to make a living. So then we introduce the two options. What can we, how can we reduce the consequence if the event uh, develops? And then, of course, the really important one, the, the really valuable one, the one that we work on very strongly in Planet Equipment Wellness, how do we reduce the chance? You know, but one times in 10 to one times in 100 to one times in 1,000, because that's where the big money is. And then I have a very quick way to tell my manager and my CEO how much money they can make if they do these changes. Because across here is dollars and cents, and down here is how many times I spend that money and what frequency I use to spend that money. And that little triangle is how much money goes into the, the back pocket of this organisation. Without spending hours on spreadsheets, you know, okay, it's rough, but it's indicative. You know? If that money there is a uh, billion dollars, Across, uh, across a period of time, uh, I can be pretty sure you adopt these better practices that drive the risk of failure down. You adopt those, you will get these results in frequency, you'll get this result in consequence, and you will get that money in the bank. Only if you make the changes. If you do nothing, then you are back up here, where you've been for the last umpteen years. So this little matrix is a key tool um, in, in plant equipment wellness because it talks about real money and the changes you need to free that money up. Now whether a company wants to take that change and, and make that decision, that's the whole point of asking the question, what do you want to do now? And if that money is of, of use to them, then let's do a trial on, on the part of the plant. Let's put this into practice. Let's just see what it means, how hard it is, how, how quickly we can make this happen.
So we're back to uh, an example, I guess, of, of how we can use this particular matrix because this is our work order we had a look at yesterday. This is the visual inspection work order of, of our pumps. We would have a history of failure of these pumps uh, and remember this, the current failure rate is a reflection of the processes used in the past. So I can now plot on this table our current practices um, and their consequence in terms of breakdowns and frequency. Then I can say, well look, is doing this work improving that, that situation? Is checking the pump base you know, slash corrosion of lead security, show me on here what that inspection does in terms of minimising the risk. And if this thing doesn't move because of doing that work, I've got to say, well, why are you doing it? Now you're doing this work and it has no value in giving benefit to the business. So I'm going to be taking the work orders in a company and plotting their effect on the business. And if I can't see their effect moving across this, uh, this matrix, I've got to challenge them and say, what's the point? You're not doing things that are actually paying off. You're just spending money, but there is no business payback from that expenditure. So this gives us a, a, another tool to actually measure our, is our current practices a, a smart thing to be doing? Not only what to do to improve and lower the risk and improve our profitability, but also uh, what we're currently doing paying off for us. Because if it's not paying off, let's find the things that are. Here's an example here. Uh, I'll bring it up in, in larger shortly. This, this is a spreadsheet from a uh, RCM analysis, Robin Centre Maintenance Analysis. This is a company in, in Western Australia where I come from. They got us in to work with their, their people in operations and maintenance and we brainstormed the, the RCM process. And I just want to show what was the result of that. I can just come across here. A little bit bigger. Okay. So across the top there is the process as we work through the RCM activities. Here is the particular unit involved. We're looking at a, a, a compressor suction control valve. Big valve, I think it's a 24 inch pipe, uh, liquefied natural gas. Dangerous stuff, uh, dangerous goods, big pipe, you know, big valve. And the team had a look at, uh, at the issues that go wrong with the valve. They, they know from experience they get uh, seat damage, they get corrosion problems with the valve and they get uh, the, the seals on the valve leak. The reasons for these, <coughs> uh, let me just see, hang on, that's a little bit, okay, that's better. So the causes of these, you know, they know that too. You know, there's an age issue there with the valve. The valve's just in service, eventually things wear. Uh, there's contamination in the process that damages the seat. The operations guys run, run their pressures High differential pressures, they're running an un, unsteady process. The, uh, and the seals also have an age factor, as seals do. Eventually seals will, will wear because they simply get old and, and get worn away. Here is the, the business impact, which is good. They've then gone in to give uh, that impact uh, a risk scale. So off their risk matrix, the company's got a risk matrix, they give these things uh, a value. Then of course the question becomes, how do we address these issues? So we've got a problem here, how do we address these? So one by one we say, okay, we're gonna perform uh, a valve integrity test uh, every year, offline. So I've gotta shut the plant down, pull that valve out, and put it on some sort of test bench and do an integrity test. Every 12 months, this is what they're saying. This is the team, this is an RCM process. The team's properly facilitated with a the guy who knows what he's doing. And this is the stuff that's coming out of the team in response to these valve problems they've got. So they're going to do a valve integrity test to address issues with damage to the valve. And also when it comes to valve performance, they're going to do an online visual. They're going to do an online inspection uh, every zonal. A, a zonal inspection means they, every three months they go across their zone of operation, look at the, at the, the various stations to see how the stations are performing. This particular pipeline is about a thousand miles long. About a thousand miles long it is. So there's 12 pumping stations, compressor stations along that whole length and, and each station is independent, automatically operated and uh, the zonal guys go there every three months and do the complete, the complete pipeline every three months. 
So that was what they chose to do. And they, they were good here. They did a very good thing. They gave us pass-fail criteria. Huh? Limits that we'll accept. No leaks, uh, no corrosion. And, and so we know what is good and what is not. Well, when they pull a valve out, does that shut the line down? Yes. Yes. And aren't they always pulling a valve out someplace? They've got bypass systems and they, they run the plant on a bypass, but yes, they've got to stop that section of plant and get people in there and, and do that work. Yeah. And they've also said what to do about it, which I'm very glad because that's been chosen by the team of knowledgeable guys in a, in a non-stress situation, you know, replace the valve. My question is, if I was to plot those decisions on this matrix, I'm not actually sure they're going to make a big difference. I'm not actually sure because uh, we can actually cost up the current cost of maintaining and the failure rates of those valves. We can get a, a point in, in, on the matrix of what the current practices are. This is in addition, this is a change to their current practices. So if we have a look at what they actually do, I can't see, I can't see how doing performance integrity test on a valve to say if the valve's working or not actually improves the reliability of the valve. Yeah? It's going to tell them if the valve's operate, yeah, sufficient operational, but that could have been found by an online inspection using uh, hysteresis loops. To me, if that decisions were put on the matrix and I could see that each of these activities are moving to less consequence or reducing likelihood of failure, then I'd accept that as worthwhile for the business. But I can't see how $10,000 maintenance work they're now added to the, business, to the operation is going to actually create $10,000 worth of value in reduced risk. Because the problem is this. The valve is old. It doesn't talk about replacing an old valve. The valve is being destroyed from contamination in the pipework. To make this valve last longer and have less problems, they've got to solve the contamination coming in at the other end. The real answer is to fix that problem. Go and find out why this contamination is coming in and get rid of it. That way the valve is not affected. In fact, every single valve in the whole pipeline will last longer. So all this extra maintenance work they've done, which they think they can justify, the RCM justifies it, on that matrix, I can't see how it helps a single bit because it will never make the valve more reliable because the problems are not in the valve. Problems are in the process. Operating practices are lousy moisture over moisture above the, above the specs. The valve's old, the valve's old, then it's an old valve. Replace it with a new one or a properly overhauled valve. That's my concern with RCM. Now, this stuff just pours out of a brainstorming situation. Nobody ever asks, where's the value? And what we do in, 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 in PW is put it on the matrix. Show me, please, in front of my face, where the value is of this job. And if there's no value, find a better answer. And the better answer, of course, is, is to fix these damn problems. That's why the valve's failing. And repairing and, and doing a yearly inspection of a valve on an integrity test is pointless. Pointless for the life of that valve. Now these guys are engineers. These guys are professional technicians that maintain this kit. Now, they know what they're doing. I'm not saying they can't do their jobs well. I'm just saying the business process they've adopted is giving them a lousy outcome for the business. It's not their fault. They're good people. It's just a lousy process they're using. How would, let's say that you decided, you know, I want to change this. I want to change this company culture. Mm. How would you, what would you do? Start with that matrix. Talk about what's happening right now. Show them. Would you go to a, another level? Would you go to management? Would you talk to the same people? Look, it's got to be top-down driven. Yeah. That's why I talk so much about money. I've got to hang the carrot out there for the CEO. Show me the money. The CEO's got to drive it. The guys on the shop floor, sleep. the guys know. Now these guys will know. When you explain what's happening, they say, we've known that for years. But no, we can't change the company. It's got to change uh, from and, the top. And why should they? Because they get paid, get, they get paid a salary, their paycheck keeps coming. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. All, all those things are true. You know? And, and we've got to front that and, and be very honest without being offensive. You know? Don't want to offend people, but we've got to be honest about, hey, this is what's really happening in your business. Your call, Mr. Manager. Actually, what I've found is some, many times the technicians do care. In fact, I've found a lot of frustration at the technician level because they do see that there's better ways to do things, or they could even eliminate maintenance. Not allowed to for, for whatever reasons 
there are. Yeah. They don't feel like they're being heard. Yeah, yeah and, and that's um, that's very true. The biggest, I think, the biggest thing is because they're not armed with the ability to show the money. Yes. To those who are above them, they can't prove the value of it. They just know that there's a better way yeah. based on experience. And, and in fact, when I began putting this together in my head, one of the things that I was conscious of all the time is. I don't want to have a lot of computerization. If I've got to get a four-year degree engineer to do this degree of analysis, then it's pointless. It's, it's the guys on the shop floor that have to take these tools and use them and be able to show their people what they already know. So everything I'd try and do is pencil and paper based or nothing more involved than a spreadsheet. You know, most guys now are okay with computers and spreadsheets. If I start having to get a the engineer in to model the process and, you know, and look at the risk here and, and look at the consequent, you know, that's beyond what average guys can do. And I, I wanted to stay away from that. We can grow this into that if we want to in the coming years and use gee whiz gear, but that isn't the point. No, that, that would be a, a loss of opportunity because it's the guys at the shop floor that need the ammunition uh, to convince their managers what the right thing to do is. If you could teach the shop floor folks and their supervisors how to use this risk, risk matrix properly yes, and to plot their own thinking and the way they maintain on this and Fantastic. show it, Fantastic. That would be yeah. wonderful. And they would have the answers. You know, the guys would come back with, with all the answers. You know, they, would, they would seat themselves, as you say, and they'd say, well, how do I get down to this low-risk zone? Right. And they'll tell you what to do. And then they own it. They'll own those ideas. You'll never hold them back. If that means more documentation and more training and, and more discussion, they'll, they'll do all that because they believe. They, they can see it for themselves. Of course, because it's visual, the manager can see. He can challenge them and say, "Why do you think that's right?" Well, this, this, and that. It would be it would be fun to take an activity exactly like this, but you you go into a plant that has fairly poor PMs. In fact, many plants have check this, check that. Mm. In fact, I stood in front of a vice president of division one time in a company, and I told him, "How do you feel about how your company's maintained? Your preventive maintenance system for your whole company is check company." <laughs> you feel good? That's, you know, that's, yes, I, yeah. I, I, I kind of brought Check that up. Check for what? Yeah, oh, look, it's, it happens right. all over the place. But, uh, but it would be fun to, to go into a company whose PMs are basically check this and check yeah. that yeah. and give them this risk matrix and teach them and, and ask them to, let's, let's develop, let's see how we can reduce risk on this piece of equipment. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, exactly. And get them involved and have yeah. them do the exercise. And yeah, and that, that, then, then the solution team are the guys that work with the equipment. Right. They know what's possible, they know what's practical, and, and um, they can do it. You know, in companies that, uh, even companies that have management by objective, for engineers they, and staff, you put four objectives down at the beginning of the year, and you know, the objectives are change out so many valves, test mm -hmm. so many valves, do this. There's no objective on there to find a better way. Yes. You know, that's, a, that's, a, Make more that's not only a non-objective, that's a diversion. Why are you even doing this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And to me, uh, the same question in a management meeting, nothing to do with maintenance. This decision that you're going to force on us, show me what this brings. Show me the benefit this decision will bring. If you can't show it visually, then it, it's a cloud, cloud floating away. You know, and you've got to turn the nebulous into concrete. That's the only way people are going to even look at it. So yeah, uh, um, that's the story. You know, we want to have a strategy or technique to, to show what we can't normally see in financial value that a CEO and a manager can, can actually accept as being something like what is probably going to happen. Uh, yeah, worst case scenario, um, make the risk visual, uh, develop the envelope to see where it will fall depending upon this business's practices. We want to if degradation is an issue, we want to which parts are the high risk parts to the equipment. Let's make sure that they are monitored carefully if need be and, and we're watching where that, that P point is. We know that stress is going to be what we want to prevent. If our current practices are in fact inducing stress or not reducing stress as well as it can go, if we're not, not managing degradation, then we know that's an opportunity to, to improve operating practices and, and eventually the outcome for the business. What this basically is saying is a good practice is to use condition monitoring to detect the degradation. That's, that's good practice, it's useful. A better practice would be to actually look at where the risks are in this equipment proactively and prevent that 
risk occurring in the first place. Uh, and the very best practice would be to reduce the stress across the machine. So it is going to be, you're going to manage its life in a way that is properly controlled and degradation is within, uh, a, uh, within the boundary if you want it to be. And we want to be able to have a technique to show the value of what's the point of doing degradation management? What's the point of ensuring we don't have this up and down pressures? We can say, well, each of these pressures, each of these points here, you actually causing maintenance costs, you're actually destroying the machine. What do you think, uh, what is, is the aspect of reliability-centered maintenance that allows them to miss this? They don't. Uh, they can't, they come up with solutions, but they can't see the true value yeah. of... Here, he's got, he's got the risk here we go. Here he's got his current risk, the current situation. They then decide what to do. There is no analysis of the risk after the decision. So we just throw a bunch of ideas on the table. They all sound okay to me from my history and experience as an engineer as a, as a, as a maintainer. Oh, well, yeah, I don't mind doing another valve inspection every month, every, every year. Yeah, that's okay. It never asks to prove the value of that. And, and, and this, this guy did the RCM incorrectly, which I don't think he's done. I think he's done it the way it's supposed to be written up in the books. Um, what's missing is there's no proof it's actually a good idea. It's, it's just an assumption that has come out of an RCM process. Must be a good idea because with all these engineers together, it must be a good idea. So they need another column or two. They need to, they need to ask, is it financially sensible? Yeah, that, that's, that's, all they've got to do is put, this, the, put the thing onto, um, onto the matrix, you know, before and after. If after has not moved from before, well, it's a waste of time. Do they even use a matrix? Do they even look at it? Only to grade the current risk, yeah. not to degrade the risk after the decision. Even, even in the RCM process, if I'm not mistaken, they don't put dollars and cents to risk. No one speaks about money as, as a maintenance they manager. Just, they just rate risk. They don't put dollars and cents no to thing. risk. Now, do they make an effort, uh, in your experience, to focus on system, uh, maintaining the system, and you can allow certain components to fail if the system still works, or do they? Look, I think that, that thinking is increasing. Uh, I couldn't give an example of, of a company that does that, but the realisation that yeah, a machine is a system of parts um, probably is in most maintainers' mind. They realise if this bearing is going to go, then that seal is going to be a problem, that shaft could be damaged. Most guys on the work in the machine understand the, the interaction, but uh, I don't think the business actually you know, thinks that, that way. Yeah. The, as far as the business has gotten in my experience is when they recognise that situation, they put that on the shelf as a spare. Yes. Well, at least we have, that's about as far as business has gotten in my experience. Which, which is okay. I mean, that's not a, not a bad solution. It just is an optimal solution. No. There's, a, there's better solutions out there. So we're trying to give them optimal solutions. This is not a, a cost-free solution. Now, PW isn't cost-free. It's the least cost to give us the reliability that this business needs. That's why I want to have one process that applies with every business, but the outcome of the process is for that business's situation. And that's why I want to have you know, these six process steps. We follow the same steps, but the results are for this business and another business next week will have a different result. It suits that business's risk profile and, and history and practices. Do you think um, to make the case for PEW, you know, if I'm a manager, I say, well, you have to show me what's wrong with preventive maintenance, with predictive maintenance, with RCM, um, you have to show me what's wrong and then I'll yeah. listen to you. That, that's a hard one because um, <clears throat> everybody thinks they're doing the right things. It comes back to this issue, it is, it is working to a degree that you are leaving so much behind that you cannot see because you think it's doing the best it can for you and you think what is coming out is, is optimal for us. I just can't see in fact that it's, it's nowhere near as, as the potential's not fully explored. Well, I think that's the bit we have to try and do. Slide you just had up where you had a preventive maintenance task and a yeah. risk matrix together. Yes, I mean, you can easily yes. prove with that that preventive maintenance yeah. isn't working. Yeah, that's maybe it would be good to break out a separate example. You know, here's a manufacturing operation. Here's the root problem. 
And now we're going to address it with preventive maintenance, with predictive maintenance, with, with RCM. We're going to do all these things the way they're supposed to be done. Mm. And guess what? The root problem is still hiding down here. Look, if you can do that, and, and again, if you can show them visually, you know, to say, well, we're going to apply, R we're going to apply RCM, it should move it this way. You, know, it should be like, should it, you, know, you should end up here with RCM. Will it actually get there? Um, yeah, so if you can find some way to make it clear on a financially based approach, then you've got ammunition. Do you think there's anything hidden in your book that could be used as an example if it was reworded somehow? Perhaps not so much in the book, but we can certainly develop that example. In fact, one of the things that we're going to pull out of this, this training session is what more can we add in to, to PW to, to firm it up, to, to give us good supporting evidence and, and justifiable reasons for doing things. All right, let's move on. Got that one. Okay, another way to show people the impact of risk is, is a, a risk cost calculator. This isn't something I developed. One of the people I work with in Australia um, Howard Witt, who's a reliability engineer, showed us this particular technique. But what we've done here is we've actually looked at a, a breakdown situation and said, OK, we've, we've got a, a scenario developing. If the scenario goes to the worst case of a breakdown, it, there will be a, a cost to do the odd job as an urgent situation. There'll be cost to do to plan and schedule that work and buy the parts in. And there's a cost of lost production. So if there is a breakdown, we can get a cost from these events uh, and effects. Before that happens, we can say, well, what are our choices? If we repair this as soon as possible, as in give it to us this afternoon, what's the cost of that choice? Okay, if we're gonna do this ASAP, it'll cost us uh, $2,000 to divert resources to prepare for it. We're gonna have to rush parts together and get things happening very, very quickly. You're gonna be down for the afternoon, $50,000 loss. So it could cost you, uh, if we act, this afternoon, $58,000. If you wait one week, because now we've waited one week longer and the breakdown must be getting closer and closer because the time's disappearing, uh, okay, we have no urgency cost. We don't rush guys and change resource allocation, but there will be a cost to plan and prepare and order the parts. Uh, again, you're going to be down for half a day. Uh, so wait for a week to $50,000. But of course, the chance of a breakdown is increasing. If I do it this afternoon, unlikely to fail. There's, there's an odds, you know, the, the curve might drop away quite quickly, but unlikely. A wait a week, yeah, now must be increasing in time. I mean, guess what? There's a shutdown coming up in four weeks time. If we can massage this plant across for four weeks, then the cost of doing the repair then will be the planning and scheduling and, and procurement cost uh, and the actual outage. Uh, is, it's already an outage. It won't be additional cost of downtime. It's already planned outage could be as little as $5,500. Except four weeks away, the odds are now 50-50, we're going to make four weeks. But if we do, only 5500 But if anyway along that line, along that timeline, any time uh, we don't make it and it breaks down, we're going to lose $300,000 plus. Dollars. So, so from this risk uh, chance assessment, and of course these are gut field evidence. This is something we make a judgment call on based upon our professional knowledge. If I'm concerned, I'll pull in a specialist and say, look, give me some condition monitoring on this machine, tell me where it is on its degradation curve and give us a more accurate value. So I can get this figure fairly comfortably assessed. What this simply does is this risk cost or total risk cost is a dollar representation of, of the risk of these choices. I'll either spend that money there or lose that. It'll be one or the other. But to compare the three options, here's the sort of equivalent dollar situation for each of these three options. So here's another way to make the risk visual for, for managers. And this is again, you'd sit down at a computer, operations guy, maintenance guy, and we start playing with, with scenarios. You know, what if scenarios? This money is real money, and now it depends upon how well we can manage our risk. Now you might say, well look, 50-50, no, too much risk. I don't want to do that. I'll give it to you next week. And so we plan for next week. I'm going to lose $50,000, but I could, I'm not going to lose $317,000. Or I might say, you know what? That machine, I can derate that down to half capacity for the next four weeks. Take the stress off the parts right down low. Let's do that. Let's derate the machine. And to be sure that we don't lose it in that four weeks, let's condition monitor that every couple of days. Let's watch that curve. Let's see if that curve 
Let's see how fast that curve is falling. So every couple of days, I'm going to go in there and check. Because if the curve begins to fall away very quickly, I want to pick it up fast and say, OK, no, we, we can't make four weeks. Let's plan it in for two days' time. So we're going to use all the things that are, we're allowed to use. We want to do those things. We want to do smart decisions. This is about making smart decisions. So I've got the matrix and I've got this cost, uh, risk cost calculator, both of which to me make things visible in dollars and cents and talks about what odds do you want to play with. 50-50, toss a coin. Uh, that's what it comes in, tossing a coin. Are we going to go four weeks or, or not? So now we're showing to production uh, what really is the situation they're playing with. You're playing with serious money here. It all depends which way that, that, uh, that coin falls. Or we don't take any risk, pay a bit more, but just don't risk losing a great amount of money. This is the real world. You know? It turns uh, the real world into something that's black and white, financial decision making. And in PEW, dollars and cents always at the forefront. If there's no money in this, don't go there. Not worth it. <coughs> All right, when it comes to managing and assessing risk, it's already worked out. There's a, a way of doing risk assessment and we are not going to change that. We're just going to take current practice, current best practice and apply that to assessing risk in this business's situation. So the equipment, when it comes to analysing equipment risk, there's a way of doing that which we call criti equipment criticality analysis. We're simply going to adopt that practice because it works. Nothing wrong with it in terms of what it's meant to do, show up where the risk is and the cost of, of failure. It does that very, very well. So we're going to go through a, a process that's already documented, um, look at consequences, frequency, see what the risk is and evaluate a business case. So again, dollars and cents decision making based upon real world scenarios. The whole point being is to, to have a gauge, a way of deciding how big is this risk? Is it small? Is it big? Uh, make it visible. Um, and if we can work with something that's visual, then we can do what if scenarios very, very easily. They can give an idea and say, what if I do this and introduce this change? Uh, okay, well, here's the impact because of that change. And, and so we can come down to finding very quickly what the best choice is because the risk matrix or our our risk cost calculator table will make it very clear. What's the best optimal choice in this situation right now to do? And off we go and do it. Same story as I've had before. Uh, the, the risk matrix as we see it here really is the business. This represents the, the outcomes for our business in do dollars and cents and in, in, in other factors and the frequency of our problems. So, on one page, we have how our business works, really. So I'd like to take this uh, and, and model uh, our business on that risk matrix, which I've, we've discussed that one already. There are existing processes to analyse risk. This particular diagram comes out of an Australian standard uh, 4360. It's, uh, there's a better one out now, the uh, ISO 31000 risk management guideline, only came out last year. I'm just saying, look, get a recognised risk assessment standard. Get one that world and, and industry accept. Don't invent something which is uncertain, unsure, because then guys won't have the belief in the process you're adopting. So we're going to adopt a process, and typically I use 31,000. Just, just whatever it says to do to assess risk and to gauge risk and to quantify risk, we, we do that because that's agreed across the world as a fair way to do it. So this methodology of equipment criticality is to come down to dollars and cents situations in this business, the way it's run with its history and its people and its plans for the future. What are you going to do with your machines? And each business could be different to other businesses or it may be the same. It depends upon um, each company's uh, position. But I want to have a technique that is universally accepted about uh, identifying risk that the manager, the CEO and the shop floor guys believe is a fair way to do it. Now what we tend to find when it comes with, uh, to machinery is most companies and most guys in companies know what the important machines are. And so the important machines get looked after very, very well. Now the machine that makes the big money for the company, everybody knows that machine's vital. 
And what we tend to find when it comes to maintenance expenditure, we tend to find that the important machines are well looked after because everybody knows the consequence of that is just horrendous. So the maintenance done on that is smart maintenance, the, the stuff that keeps the machine running and is looked after well. Then there's the next level of machines that are sort of the intermediate level machines. The, they're not so important, but, but important enough to be looked after. And, and our maintenance effort typically looks after those second level machines, reasonably well also. What's left behind is all the rest. The other stuff that is low criticality, or if it breaks down, we've got the spare part in the store, we can get it out, or we've got a standby unit. The trouble is, uh, when you again begin looking at the cost of maintenance, in this particular company where this survey was done, 65% of the maintenance cost was on the low criticality equipment. And in terms of us minimising our maintenance costs, we've got to be aware that most often the important stuff's already fairly well looked after. What is not looked after well and not considered uh, a consequence of, the, of their failure isn't considered is the low criticality stuff. Here, because of expensive machines and, and high, high priority, I can justify spending money on that because of the risk involved. Down here, when there's low risk, I can justify spending high technology solutions, vibration analysis and, and lubrication management. They're high technology costs that, are, that I can justify in low criticality machinery. So these machines that absorb a big part of our maintenance cost but aren't important enough to, to prevent failure, we've got to find a, a simpler low cost way to, to look after them as well. And what we end up doing at these low critical machines that suck up the money from maintenance, we introduce low cost condition monitoring. We use our, hopefully our operators, to go out and you know, listen to machines, take temperature readings, you know, simple vibration analysis tools or detection tools. So for this area here where we lose most of our maintenance spend, I can't afford high technology, but I can afford low technology with some smart people that know how this machine's meant to work. And we go and do an inspection route using my checklist for defined criteria. And now I have a defined criteria inspection process using low cost technology. And now I'm going to monitor these things also to a level of, uh, of risk management. So we're not going to do anything in, in, in plant and equipment wellness that is different to what is happening already in industry. We're going to be selective of what we're going to use, when to use it, in a way that optimises the cost. So our whole point of, of this is to minimise the cost to the stuff that delivers value for the business. And that's the baseline that we work, uh, work to. So I'm going to use RCM if RCM is useful. I'm going, to, I'm going to use operating checklists if it's useful. But I'm going to have it done in a smart way where we don't miss important information. So the guy goes out and his checklist, one more thing they're going to introduce, he's trending. Because this guy will have values that he will measure against. So when he comes back from his, his, in, his uh, inspection round with the, with, the, with the data, he's going to type it up into a computer and we're going to start trending the data. Now, if this is pressure and this is time, the guys will start developing condition monitoring performance sheets. You know, it was like that and went up like this, there's something wrong. And so the operations guys or the, or the person that, that uh, collects the data is going to plot that on a, on, a, on a computer. It'll spit out the chart and he will know, gee, you know what? Our 3T range, that's our 3T range. You know, I'm outside of my range. Something's changed. Let me go and find out before it breaks down what's happened. So we're going to teach our people simple, smart choices, smart observations to make. And then we're going to start plotting these things to turn them visually. We want to make these things visual. Yeah, so this technique we're going to apply to a company, look at its com the company assets and arrive at the best strategy that minimises frequency and minimises consequential costs. It will never be zero. It'll be the, the least possible in the current situation. And of course, the challenge will be to improve things all the time. Not to accept today for what we see, but to find smarter answers, better answers, quicker answers, lower cost answers in a scripted way of doing and delivering these things. Criticality, when we have a look at all the factors, 
these are the things that we look at and, and assess uh, what sort of hazards there in the plant, what's the effect of machine failure, what's the effect of component failure on production, any safety issues that arrive out of a problem, uh, and what are the knock-on business consequences, discretionary type losses from the event on this equipment. So there's a well-structured process that we're simply going to adopt. Um, that's documented around the world. There's plenty of data on how to assess the criticality of machinery. In the end, we're going to simply adopt the risk management process in, in a, a respected standard. What are the risks? Uh, what sort of uh, situations arise? What are the costs involved? What are the controls we're going to do? And then once you put the controls in place, what monitoring must we observe and adopt to make sure that risk, risk management outcome is actually being achieved? So this monitoring will involve you know, these sort of measurements here. So this particular five-step activity, uh, these boxes here, that comes out of a risk management standard. That's typically uh, the steps in the process to come up with uh, recognition of an issue, resolving it in some sort of way, putting resolution into practice, and monitoring the practices actually delivering the resolution outcomes that we expect. So there'll be a risk matrix. Um, this is simply various ways that we describe risk. You'll see the risk described as a certain risk, and a likely, possible, unlikely, rare. These are words that international standards adopt to mean degrees of risk. Sometimes it will actually be described like this. A failure event will occur at this site annually or more. So we look at the event and we gauge it in a descriptive fashion. Or we might describe it in a frequency fashion. These, these particular columns all come out of international standards and best practice uh, guides of how to describe likelihood. Because likelihood is the hard one. A cost consequence, we can get the cost fairly easily from our financial modelling on a spreadsheet. But the chance of something happening, the chance, you can't be sure. Risk is always there, depends on opportunity, depends upon the chance. So we can never get a, a sure, firm number of definitely going to happen every time, uh, every once in a hundred times, at time 55, happen at time 55 every single time. Never is that way. So we describe risk in, in a, a rubbery, woolly fashion you know, around about this sort of frequency. Very hard to get exact numbers with risk because it depends on certain assumptions happening and if they don't happen, that risk assumption, you know, that number means nothing. And so we're going to live with what the standards recommend. You know, we're going to use fairly simple raw words that give you an envelope on the risk matrix. Again, if you look at risk internet, uh, standard uh, risk standards and risk management standards, they use templates to assess the risk and the scenarios that cause these risks. And they use templates to suggest what, what to do to treat that risk. So I'm going to say, well, Stick with that. Don't, uh, don't invent a, another way to analyse and assess risk. You just stick with what is known in practice. So it may require we sit down with our people on the work, on the work front or, or the, the shop floor or with the managers and say, well, here are the event scenarios in our um, process uh, flow diagram. So for each of our steps in the process flow diagram, here are the risk situations that can arise in these, can, these conditions. For each of these activities and each of these possible risks, what are we going to do to treat those? So we're going to take a, a written document, a handwritten document, into a meeting and say, guys, here's all the potential problems and here's the consequential cost of these problems. Um, do you want to live with them or not? If you don't want to live with them, okay. What are we going to do? How are we going to treat those? You give me the answers that you are willing to accept and live with, and I'll write them down here. So we're going to come in with frequency of failure and the cost of the consequence of that failure and if it's too much risk, we're going to say, OK, what's the proactive actions to take and put in place to reduce that risk? And of course, we'll let the matrix off to one side. As a decision's made or, or discussed, we show in the matrix. Well, this idea moves it forward one cell. We're going to save $10,000 each time this event arises. That's, uh, and, and we're going to actually you know, watch that uh, risk move on that matrix from the decisions made around that table to address that problem. And the aim is just to keep it pencil and paper level analysis uh, or, or on a spreadsheet, but something that's simple that everybody can use. We'll come up with some sort of table, you know, the asset, the sub-assemblies in the asset, the various costs of, of the situations, 
the current risk scenarios as it is right now, what we're going to do about managing our situations. If it's an extreme risk, and this is actually um, this is the engine of, a, of a, a big mining truck. So if the risk at the moment is too high, it's too high, then we can't live with that. What are we going to do operationally? What are we going to do maintenance-wise? And of course, what's the risk after we do this? And if this is still extreme, after all this is still extreme and hasn't actually moved, then what's the point of doing that? We've not changed the risk profile. We have to get this final risk has to be clearly better than what we currently got. Because if I can go to a lesser risk, then I must be freeing up money that I'm now spending because that money won't be spent because there's less chance of things going wrong. So that money I'm now spending at extreme levels of risk, if I can get that down to a medium level of risk, well, I've got a money I'm going to save, which now is the profit I can justify to spend on any, on any improvements that need to be made. So yeah, this is, a, again, a, a quick overview of what we're looking for. We're looking for clear evidence that what we're going to do to reduce the current risk actually will work. And if I can't see a change from extreme to hopefully a couple of levels lower, from, uh, to, to medium from extreme, two levels of risk lower, then I'm not sure it's actually worth doing that job because I can't see it freeing up any benefit for the company. And that's all done before we make any changes. So now I've got reason to either cancel that change and forget about it or accept it and say, look, there's real money here. Let's get on with it. I'm wasting time.